We are going to solve the linear programming problem using the simplex method. So you will start with your constraints and you want to rewrite your constraints as equations. So on my first constraint, I have 5x1 plus x2 and I want to be able to say it's equal to 50 instead of less than or equal to 50. So we come in and we add what is known as a slack variable, and since it's the first equation, we'll just call it S1. And that allows us to say that it's equal to 50 instead of less than or equal because we've added some unknown amount to what could be the smaller side. On the second constraint, we have a 3x1 plus a 2x2. And right now, that could be less than or equal to 70. Because we want it to only equal 70, we'll add a second slack, some unknown amount, to balance it out. On my third constraint, I have x1 plus x2. And right now, that could be less than or equal to 60. Because I want to be able to say it's equal to 60, I'll add a third slack, S3. You do not do anything with your non-negativity constraints other than know that they exist so that in the end, when you have your final answers, you should have values of x1 and x2 that are greater than or equal to 0. So next, you actually take a look at your objective function and you want to set it equal to zero by moving everything to the left-hand side. And so in order to do that, we'll have to subtract these terms. So minus 2x1 and minus 3x2 on both sides. So that equation becomes a minus 2x1 minus 3x2 plus your z is equal to zero. So next, you'll set up your augmented matrix. And when you do that, it's important that your main variables come first. So those are x1 and s2, followed by your slack variables, s1, s2, and s3 in this case, followed by z, and then your constants will always be on the right-hand side of the line for the augmented matrix. So as I look at my equations up here, I'm just going to simply take the coefficients. So 5 is the coefficient of x1. 1 is understood to be the coefficient of s2. There's a 1 that's understood to be the coefficient of s1. And because that first equation does not have an s2, an s3, or a z, we put zeros in those positions. Remember, the line is like the equal to, and your constant is 50. Now, to start out with, that row will represent the value of S1. For my second row, if I take my coefficients, I have a 3. Notice that uh, the coefficient of X2 is a 2. We do not have an S1, so we put a 0. Your coefficient for S2 is understood to be a 1. We do not have an S3 or a Z, so those are zeros, and your constant is 70. And then starting out, that row will represent the value of S2. When I go to my third equation, it is understood to be a coefficient of 1 in front of X1, 1 in front of X2. I do not have an S1. I do not have an S2. The coefficient of S3 is understood to be 1. There is not a Z. And my constant is 60. And then starting out, that row represents the value of S3. Now we put a line to separate our constraints from our objective function. And so on the bottom row, the coefficients of our objective function are negative 2, negative 3. There is not an S1, S2, or S3, so those are all zeros. The coefficient of Z here is understood to be 1, and the constant is a 0 and that row represents your z value. Okay, so now that our augmented matrix is actually set up, we are going to go in here so that we can find our, what's known as our pivot element. And so when you're looking for your pivot element, you are only going to focus on these numbers on the bottom row, the ones that represent your main and your slack variables.
And out of those numbers, you want to choose the one that is the most negative. And that just simply means the furthest to the left of zero, okay? If you don't have negatives, you've either set it up wrong or you've gone through a rotation and you're actually finished. But um, of course, we're just starting, so we can't be finished. So this becomes what we call the pivot column because of choosing that negative three being the most negative. Now, within your pivot column, you're going to look at only the positive numbers. And so we will look at only those numbers. We will not look at the bottom because it's not positive. And with each of those numbers, you're going to divide the constant on that same row by the number. So on row one, my constant is 50. Oops, let me get a pen. My constant is 50, and I'll divide it by the number in the pivot column, 1. So 50 divided by 1 would equal to 50 for that first row. Let me just put it over here. All right, on row 2, you're going to take the 70, which is the constant in that row, and you're going to divide it by the 2 from your pivot column. 70 divided by 2 is 35. For the third row, you're going to take the constant of 60, divide it by the 1 in your pivot column. So 60 divided by 1 is 60. Now, out of these numbers, you choose the one that is the smallest. So this 35 is the smallest, which means we circle that row, and that row becomes my pivot row. So my pivot element in this case is the two. And so some of the questions may just ask to find to get to that point of either setting up the matrix or finding the pivot element. So that is your pivot element. Now, once we have found our pivot element, we have to use row operations to turn it into a one. And so if you'll recall with row operations, um, anytime we think of a 1, we want to think of the word reciprocal. Remember, it ends in an L that looks like a 1. So our pivot element is a 2. I would say to myself, the reciprocal of 2 is 1 half. So you're going to come in here and multiply that pivot row by 1 half so that you can turn your pivot element into a 1. So on row 2, 1 half times 3 would give me 3 halves. 1 half times 2, that's the 1 I wanted. 1 half times 0 is 0. 1 half times 1 is 1 half. 1 half times 0 is 0. 1 half times 0 is 0. And 1 half times 70 is 35. So that is your new... Uh, pivot row, which I'm going to go ahead and circle it. And then the other thing that changes is the label of that row started out as S2. But once you find a pivot column, the label of the pivot column will replace the label of the pivot row. So that label should now be X2. At this point, we're not going to do anything else to the other rows for this step, so I'll bring them straight down as is. Their labels stay the same. And my bottom row. Now, just to keep my focus on my pivot column, I'm going to also circle it. So notice your pivot element is now the one that you wanted. The next step is you have to turn all of the other numbers in your pivot column into zeros. So I need a zero here, here, and here. And in order to do that, you will use your pivot row. So with row operations, when we think of zeros, we think of the word opposite, and the O in opposite looks like a zero, so that helps us remember what to do. 
So starting with the one on the top row, I would ask myself, what's the opposite of positive one? And the opposite of that would be negative one. So I'll multiply my pivot row by negative one and then add those numbers to the top row. So I'm gonna go ahead and do my multiplying first. Negative one times three halves would be negative three halves. Negative one times positive one is negative one. Negative one times zero is zero. Negative one times a half would be a negative half. Negative one times zero is zero. Negative one times zero is zero. And negative one times 35 would be negative 35. Now, as we add those up, we will record the new numbers into a new matrix. So when I add five plus negative three halves, if you think of a common denominator, like that's the same as 10 over two plus negative three over two, so you would be left with seven over two. One plus negative one, that's the zero I wanted. One plus zero is one. Zero plus negative a half is negative a half. 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, and 50 plus negative 35 would be 15. And that row is still considered S1. Now row 2, since it's our pivot row, is not changing at this point, so we'll bring it straight down. But rows three and four, we'll go ahead and get the zeros where we need them as well. So let me switch colors. All right, so on row three, I need a zero where this one is. So again, I'll think of the opposite. The opposite of positive one is negative one. So again, I'll multiply the pivot row by negative one and then add those values to row three. Negative one times three halves is negative three halves. Negative one times positive one is negative one. Negative one times zero is zero. Negative one times a half is negative a half. Negative one times zero is zero. Negative one times zero is zero. And negative one times 35 is negative 35. So now add them up. One plus negative three halves would be the same as two over two minus three over two. So I would be left with negative one over two. 1 plus negative 1 is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus the negative 1 half is negative 1 half, 1 plus 0 is 1, 0 plus 0 is 0, and 60 minus 35 would leave me with 25. And then that row is still S3. All right, finally, the last step of this rotation is to get a zero where I have this negative three. So when I think of zeros, I think of opposites. The opposite of negative three is positive three. Remember, you come to your pivot row, and you'll do your pivot row times positive three added to your bottom row this time. So let me fix that. So when I multiply three times three over two, I get nine over two. Three times one is three. Three times zero is zero. Three times a half is three halves. Three times zero is zero. Three times zero is zero. And three times 35 would be 105. All right, so now we'll add them up. So nine over two minus two would be the same as nine over two minus four over two, and that would leave me with five over two. Three plus negative three is zero. Zero plus zero is zero. Three halves plus zero is three halves. Zero plus zero is zero. Zero plus one is one, and zero plus 105 is 105. And then that row is still my Z. Okay, so at this point in the simplex method, you go back and you look at those indicators again here on the bottom row. If there is still a negative down there, you repeat the process of choosing the largest negative, identifying your pivot column, and so on. If you don't see any more negatives, 
like we have here, then you know you are finished. So that's a huge relief because we are finished. Now, we've got to interpret our answer, so I'm just going to kind of give me some space in here so that I can write my final answers instead of going to a new page. So, looking at my ending matrice, the label over here on the left side tells you the variable. The number over here tells you its value. So, I can see from this first row that S1 so let me get a pen. S1, third time's the charm here. S1 has a value of 15. All right, when I look at the second row, the label is X2. I look at the constant, it has a value of 35. So, X2 has a value of 35. If I go to the third row, the label is S3, and I come over here, it has a value of 25. So S3 has a value of 25. And then finally, on my bottom row, The label is Z, come over here, the value is 105. So I would say the value of Z is equal to 105. Now, any variables that are missing have values of zero. So since S2 is not listed on the side labels down here, it has a value of zero. And six, since X1 is also not listed, it has a value of zero. So this would be your final solution to the linear programming problem.